Sorry for the long story, but I can't figure out this person's motive. One night I was in bed with my boyfriend. It was about 1.30am. I get a text from a random number saying, Is this and then my name? Sorry for messaging late and out of the blue like this, but I don't think then saying my boyfriend's name is being honest and I need to talk to you. We exchange a few texts and basically they're accusing my boyfriend of cheating on the both of us. Obviously I was annoyed, but bear in mind it was June 2020, bang in the middle of coronavirus lockdown in the UK. We'd spent every day together since March. He denied it all and insisted he didn't know who this person was. The same number starts texting him, angry text, calling him a lying rat, not looking good for a boyfriend. But this is where it gets weird. This person gives no specifics, they won't tell me their name, what my boyfriend has done, only that he is a liar and that I was an idiot for believing him. I'd ask, but they would just reply with vague angry texts. Their grammar and spelling was good, but they'd use slang words from our local area. We assumed it was just some kid who found our numbers off Facebook and were having a laugh, so we just ignored it. Then nothing, until my boyfriend gets a text the following afternoon, asking him to meet at the local social club for some company. Me and my friend got straight in the car and went down there. No one was there. The club was closed because of COVID, but we couldn't help but feel like we was being watched. It was really weird. A few days go by and the same number starts texting me again. This time, the text language is weird. It's like spelling mistakes and stands stuff like, why you too instead of you too, that kind of thing. It felt like it was a different person texting me. They seemed a lot angry with me now because I didn't believe them straight away. Then they text me, you're so dull. I see him leaving your house earlier, LMAO. Cocky, I said something funny like, where's my house then? And then they replied with my street name. They also know things about us, like the fact that he was in the army, but I guess you can figure that out from social media photos. I called them loads, but it would just ring twice and cut off. I tried switching the number on WhatsApp and on a few social medias. Nothing. Only on Instagram, the number would come up with a location of a film company in Rattle, Netherlands. When I googled the number, its provider is Tizmi. I have never heard of it, but it looks like it might be a fake number. Never asked for any money or anything like that. Don't get why someone go through so much effort just to wind us up. The last text I had was, Okay, you'll see eventually, LMAO. Creepy. Any advice please? I moved a lot growing up. By the time freshman year of high school came around, I had moved seven times or so. And was about a year and a half into my most recent move. I had a pretty close group of friends in middle school, and we all went to high school together. I met him through one of those close friends. We were in band together, and even though he was almost four years older than us, we welcomed him into our group. Sam was easily twice my size, tall and heavy set, and originally kind of intimidating, although I was never afraid of large men before him. Lesson learned. I kind of had a bad home life, I spent as much time as I could at school sometimes hanging around the school campus until 6 or 7 at night with a friend group. Three of us lived in the same direction, and we would walk the half hour trip together until our paths split. One slightly colder evening, Sam offered to walk me home since the others had already gone home. I just thought he was being a gentleman. He mentioned something from a previous move when he lived in California. He didn't walk a friend home and something horrible happened. He left it at that, and I let him walk me home. We got a lot closer after that. We bonded over living in California and exchanged numbers. He would message me late into the night about his depression and self-harm, and I wanted to help. A few months later, he tried asking me out. It was this big romantic gesture. He learned a Disney song, and the ukulele and sang it to me in the cafeteria. But I was already dating someone, and when I turned him down, he got angry. A freaky, quiet, twitchy kind of angry. I felt so bad. I started seeing him everywhere. We were still friends, we still hang out in groups, but I would pass him on the street, walking somewhere, and a few minutes later, I'd see that he changed direction and had started to follow me. He would walk me to classes by following me in the passing period at a distance. I started to minimise the group time we spent together, and he would follow me more. 
I had friends meet me at each class and want me to know my next one because I felt unsafe. He knew where I lived. Then he started to talk, not to me, but to mutual friends about one girl in California who he tried to walk home. At first, she just shared my name, some crazy coincidence. Then she had the same brown curly hair and blue eyes, and every time he rambled about her, she became more and more like me. And then he said what happened. Over literal weeks, this fantasy evolved. They were walking home, and they were jumped by some guy with a knife. It was a robbery gone wrong on her birthday, January 24th, my birthday, and she died horribly and couldn't react in time. She bled out on his arms. Sarah, who had brown curly hair, blue eyes at my name, my birthday, and sounds just like me, bled out in his arms. Each retelling added more and more detail, and the guy with his sick fantasy about my death would follow me around and knew where I lived. My boyfriend was abusive, mentally and physically, but I stayed as close to him when I could, whenever I could, because if the worst happened, I knew for sure he could throw a punch. I never felt safe at school or in a little town walking from home or walking from home in the dark. One day, at school, he had a breakdown, freaked out and ran out of the school in a panic. I was sent after him and found him curled up on the floor. I got closer. I knew about his anxiety and depression, and my safety aside, I wanted to make sure he was okay. It was then that he told me about this horrifying story that I'd been hearing from mutual friends with added details. We had been walking home from a concert in California. We passed a dark alley and a homeless man came out with a rusty knife and asked for anything valuable. I fumbled for my phone, I didn't have anything else on me, and he thought what I was calling the cops. He stabbed me. Once, twice and again, Sam stood there, horrified. He saw red and grabbed a broken glass bottle near my body and attacked some homeless man. He killed him with his own knife. He told me he killed someone. My stalker had killed someone. It didn't matter how messed up he was anymore. I didn't care if it was fantasy or real. I didn't care how it would affect his mental health anymore. I wanted to go to the police. I was scared for my life. My friends convinced me to go to the school counsellor first. That morning, we went and told them everything. The stalking, the stories. How he admitted to murder and that he was the reason they moved from California. How I was afraid for my life and wanted to call the police. My counsellor didn't take us seriously. She went to the principal, and the principal, not a mental health expert, called Sam in to talk about the accusations. The principal then informed me that he didn't think that Sam had any kind of mental illness and that I wasn't in any danger. And that was that. I lost faith in adults, gave up on going to the police, stayed with my friends walking me between classes, hiding behind my abusive boyfriend, and looking behind me at every step of my walk home that year. The counsellors ended up gaslighting us to the point where it feels like a fever dream now. And I would think it's made up if it weren't for my journal entries recording the events and my growing panic, and the similar stories from my friend group. Just for some clarification, I don't think anyone actually died in California. I think he's a pathological liar, and that he was so deep in a fantasy that he convinced himself it was real. No, I wasn't physically hurt, but it was emotionally scarring, and the threat that he posed to me was 100% real. Hello, I'm French, so I apologise in advance if I make any mistakes. As I said, I live in France, and this story happened to me this summer, just after the lockdown ended. I was, and am still 19. After this lockdown ended, I went to my grandparents to spend a few weeks. I got tested before, and no problem there. My grandparents live in a small city in the north of France, and they have a dog who's quite big. When I was really young, I lived at my grandparents for a year, and at the time, the dog was only a puppy. Her name was Chippy, in French, which kind of means little devil in English, but in an affectionate way. Considering when I was living there, I played with her a lot, we were both really close, and this will have its importance later. Two of my hobbies are having long walks and running, thus every evening I was going out for a long walk with the dog. There's a track that follows a path through the forest. Then there's a small hill, and on top of that, a big place with lots of fields. I run there a lot and I know the place. The air's fresh and the view's quite beautiful. So I was going there with the dog every day. It was also helping my grandparents to have her doing lots of exercise. The first time we went there, nothing special happened. We just enjoyed our walk. 
It's about six or seven kilometers, so basically an hour walk. The next day, when we arrived on top of the hill in a field, it was probably around 10 p.m., but there was some light because it's summer. There were three other people walking in the field. They were younger than me, probably 15 or 16. I also noticed they were smoking, so my guess is that they used to come here so they couldn't be seen by their parents. We went past them, and I greeted them, and they greeted back. Once again, nothing special there. For a whole week, I did this walk around the same time, 10pm, and passed those three guys with nothing special happening, and it was perfectly fine to me this way. My second week, as I usually went for a walk with the dog Chippy, and arrived at the fields, there was only one of the three boys. He wasn't smoking this time though. When he saw me, I was at the entrance of this field just after the little hill climb, so the entrance of the forest was just behind me. He did a sign with his hand to catch my attention and asked if I had a lighter, which I actually had in my pocket. I told him, yeah, sure. So he walked to me, hands in the pockets of his hoodie. When he came near me, for some reason I felt a shiver. It's crazy how sometimes your instincts know there's a problem, but you don't listen to it because nothing looks weird to you. I handed over the lighter when he passed by. At that moment, my dog was staring at him. And then everything happened really fast. He did a really fast movement with his hand, coming from the hoodie, and I only saw something shining. I just had a reflex of throwing myself back, so hard that I fell down actually. And I then realised it was a knife that he was holding and he tried to stab me. What saved me is my dog, god bless her. When she saw the guy trying to stab me, she jumped up on him and he fell down. As I said before, he's a really big dog. I immediately got up on my feet and heard something from behind me, from the entrance of the forest. I saw two guys wearing animal masks running to me. They were probably the two friends. In this kind of situation, your brain just acts for itself. You don't really think at all. It's just a case of the answer was found when it was really simple. The other guy was still on the ground. I just watched my dog and told her, run. I started running and she followed me. But I heard the worst possible thing from the guy who got up. We'll catch him. Don't let him go. At this moment, I was totally terrified. I was just running and running, and I was hearing them running behind me. I was only thinking, how long are they going to follow me, and who the hell are they? And this was the time I was really happy to be a runner. I was clearly better than those guys, and that totally saved me, because they chased me for something that felt like an eternity to me. Fortunately, at the end of the field, there's another entrance to the forest, and this time it's a descent to the end of the road. I heard the steps of the three guys vanishing as I arrived at the end of the forest. Though, I didn't stop running until I arrived at my grandparents' house and locked myself in. I caught a massive breath and gave her a huge hug. I saw in her eyes that she totally understood what happened, and I've never been so happy to have her in my life. After that, I told everything to my grandparents, and we called the police, but they didn't find anyone. I really don't know what these guys wanted, but the animal masks made it seem like it was some kind of satanic ritual. I really don't want to know anyway. I still do long walks with Chippy, the hero dog, but I now go earlier into places with little more people. I hope you enjoyed my story. Again, I apologise if it is a bit all over the place. I'm French, my English isn't great. And to the three guys in the forest, let's never meet again. Hey folks, I'm kind of new, and this is my first story I've submitted here. So let's get started. I must clarify, this didn't happen to only me, but my uncle too. This was after a Christmas Eve party, and when everyone went home, I decided to stay because my cousin and I were watching a movie. My uncle, who used to walk his dogs in the woods next to a park, went off to take them out. Before this, my aunt told him not to do that because it was too dark out there. It was around 4 or 5 a.m. He didn't care much, and he went off anyway. My aunt was still worried, so I went along with him. Everything was quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a relaxing walk as usual, and I wasn't really paying attention to the surroundings, when suddenly the dogs went still. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped in their way to stare or bark at other animals, like rats or birds or insects or other dogs. However, this time it was different. When the dogs went still, my uncle and I noticed something was going wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious, they were kind of nervous, anxious and afraid. One of the dogs, the largest one, was growling and shaking. 
As my uncle started to get worried about the situation, we heard it. People in the woods. We didn't see how many because of the darkness. They were saying something. We all gather here by the blood of... Then we couldn't understand. We... Then we couldn't understand again. The and I. And then we couldn't understand again. As my uncle and I heard that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. As we all left, he turned his head back and he only saw the slight movement of the branches and shrubs. Perhaps because these people were trying to hide. After all that happened, he hasn't walked his dogs near those woods, nor will he do it again when it's dark. So to the strangers in the woods, let's never meet again. So this happened a year ago, and I'm still pretty shaken by this whole event. I thought I'd tell my story. I live in the UK and it's autumn, and it gets dark around 4pm. There was a school autumn break that week, so all the kids are at home. So that means my girlfriend's brother was home too. I had been with her a year at this point, so her family knew me pretty well, and her brother enjoyed my company. She'd recently been pretty stressed out. Her parents were going across country for the day, so she had to look after her brother. But I thought that I'd give the day to herself so she can just call off. I asked her parents if I could look after their son for the day instead, and they agreed. So I came around 8am, and they let me in before they set off. My girlfriend's brother woke up about an hour later, and she followed shortly afterwards. We went out for breakfast at a local cafe together, and went back to her house when we were done. And once I dropped her off, I took her brother to the park. We got there at about 2pm, and the place was pretty packed. Eventually, the sun started going down, and the place was completely empty by 4pm. I texted my girlfriend, and told her we'd be home in a bit, and she said okay. I'm going to be honest, I completely lost track of time. Me and her brother were having fun being the only two in the park. Me and her brother were stood up on this really tall climbing frame with a slide on it. It was almost pitch black at this point, so I was using my phone as a flashlight. A notification popped up on my screen, and it was my girlfriend asking where we were. I responded, oops, coming home now, and told her brother we had to go. He sighed and asked if we can go down the slide, so I said yes. Before I went down, I knew what the park looked like. There were streetlights all around it, benches everywhere, some trees, and places for kids to play. When I came out the slide, there was something weird. A man had appeared out of nowhere and was stood beneath one of the streetlights. He had a trench coat on and a beanie hat. I immediately got my girlfriend's brother behind me and called out to the man with a friendly, Hi there. I got a response. He started... groaning. I noticed that he was swaying back and forth in the light, and he had his mouth open, drawling with a blank look in his eyes. This made me feel really uneasy. I picked the little bro up and kept checking on this guy the entire time. There was an exit to the left that led to a path back home. So I left out that way and kept checking behind me every few seconds. The guy was still stood there. The path where the guy was stood merges with a big main path if you walk out through some bushes and so does one I walked through. I was walking down the path for about two minutes, periodically checking behind me, and thought I was in the clear. I wasn't. I was on a straight stretch of path, with lots of street lights when I saw him again. He was stood beneath one, looking up at it, and he was playing with something in his hands. I looked a little closer, and I realised it was a knife. I kept walking and walking, checking behind me constantly, my girlfriend's little brother was so scared he had his head tucked into my chest. I noticed that the guy seemed to be moving into the streetlights whenever I turned around. Initially, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but then I started counting them and realised the two streetlights behind him had definitely turned into five. I could faintly hear the groaning noise, and he was occasionally moaning as well. I picked up the pace and turned the corner, getting closer to the last stretch of street before I got to my girlfriend's house. That was when I heard him behind the rows of bushes. That moaning noise really sounded angry now, and I heard heavy footsteps bounding down the path. The man was absolutely running. I had immediately broke into a sprint and didn't stop until I turned an alleyway at the front of the street and got behind my girlfriend's house. There was a big bush there, so I crouched down behind it and spammed her phone with messages to open the back gate. I hugged her brother close until she opened it for us and got us in quickly. It felt like years. 
I went to the front of the house, and it confirmed that I'd managed to shake him. He was now in the street, circling where I'd been, outside the alleyway just moments ago. He was still moaning. He had that knife in his hand still. He started kicking people's bins over. I called the police immediately, but he was gone by the time they arrived, and as far as I know, they never found him. There was a similar incident near the area a few months ago, I saw on Facebook, but I don't think anything came of that either. Her parents thanked me for keeping their son safe, and didn't hold any ill will against me for the situation. He went back to normal pretty much the day afterwards, but he still had nightmares about the event. When my country isn't in lockdown, I'm allowed to look after him with my girlfriend, funnily enough, but we haven't been to that park ever since and I still check over my shoulder and break into a cold sweat every time I'm alone in the street. So, I've recently discovered this page and thought I'd share my story here. I'm not sure if this belongs here, but I don't know if it would fit anywhere else. So, I lived in a pretty nice area with my husband and some family friends. We lived there for a few years with nothing bad happening around us. It felt like a very safe neighbourhood. Now for context, I'm a very short white female and considered disabled even though I look fine, but I could never really beat anyone up since my disability has limited my activity severely. Anyway, on to the story. This happened about a year before we moved and I had some stories pop up on Facebook of some traffickers that were targeting women and children at the local store that we live right behind. I was freaked out, and so I made it a point not to go to the store without my husband. I still got the news articles about people being followed and grabbed and kidnapped from the store, but I felt pretty safe as long as I didn't go anywhere without my husband. I was going to work one day, I worked about 15 minutes away from my house. It was a call centre kind of out in the middle of nowhere. There were fields every which way. I worked at the afternoon shift and was one of the last people to leave at night. I had to stop and get gas and was a little freaked out because I was scared to go anywhere about my husband but I wasn't going to make it to work and back home so I had no choice. I stopped at the station and was slightly relieved that it was super busy. I got out and pumped my gas when this big van pulled up in the spot next to mine. A guy got out and started pumping his own gas, then he walked around the pump and got in between my car and me. He smiled and said, Wow, your car's so clean. How'd you get it so clean? I was flabbergasted at the question. My car was a mess. It was dirty with bugs and stuff on it. Why don't you show me how you get it so clean? He reached out to touch me but I jerked back. Another car pulled up behind me and the guy got out. I think he freaked the guy out because he walked back to his van. I quickly finished pumping my gas and got into my car, locked the doors and sped away. A few minutes later, I look out my window and the van is behind me, riding my bumper pretty much. I could see the guy smiling and laughing with some other guy. I was pretty freaked out but figured he was going to the freeway. We passed the freeway but he kept following me. Now I was really freaked out. The only place on the road now is my work. I called my husband but he didn't answer since he was at work. I was freaking out so I just picked up the speed and continued to work. I kept looking back and the van was still there but just a little bit further back. I made it to work. It was a large building with lots of cars in the parking lot. I parked right at the front of the doors in a handicapped spot and ran into the doors. I looked back through the doors and I saw the guy stopped in front, looking pissed. I ran up to my department and went right up to a friend who was an ex-military guy. He carried a couple of guns on him at all times. I cried as I told him what happened. I got to work and was still freaked out all day. We closed and I was walking down to my car. I peeked out the windows and that's when I saw the white van. I couldn't see anyone in there and I wasn't even sure if it was the same van. I ran back to my department and told my friend what was going on. He pulled out his gun and walked me outside. The van had now moved right behind my car. My friend walked me to his car and we got in and he drove me right up to my car. Then he followed me all the way home and sat outside until I was inside the house. 
I could see the fan following us, but once we got past the freeway, he turned onto it. The next afternoon on my way to work, I passed a gas station and the van pulled out. Again, they followed me to work, but then turned away once I got to the parking lot. This went on for about a week. They would follow me to work, leave, then be outside when I was leaving, and my friend would walk me out. My buddy told me that they were probably trying to learn my schedule so they could figure out a time to jump me. He insisted that I take one of his guns, just in case he wasn't there at work to walk me out. I didn't want it though, as I was afraid that if I had it, then I'd get pulled over for something and get in trouble with having a gun not in my name and not having a permit for it. I was telling my husband that evening and how his van was still following me and he suggested that I should call the cops and let them know. I honestly don't know why I didn't think of that. So the next morning, when I was about to get ready for work, I called. I told them everything, then I left for work. Just like clockwork, the van pulled out of the gas station and started following me. We were on the long stretch of road that nothing was on when I spotted a car parked off to the side of the road. I passed, and then the car passed, and then the lights came on. The van was pulled over. I later found out that the men following me had several warrants for rape and attempted kidnapping. The back of the van had knives, ropes, gloves, masks, chloroform, and some other sketchy crap in it. The cops believed that I was going to be their next target. When I got to work, my friend wasn't there. He was sick. I'm so glad that I called the cops that morning because I don't think I would have made it home if he wasn't there to walk me out. Anyway, that's my creepy story. I hope you guys liked it. It's 100% true. We have since moved out and I live in a not as nice area, but so far I haven't noticed any creepy people around, but I always carry pepper spray whenever I go out. When I was 13, I broke my leg in a nasty bicycle accident. I ended up in a plaster cast from my hip to my ankle for 8 weeks. As it was coming up to Christmas, my younger brother wanted to go to the theatre to see the Christmas show. I was 13, moody and accompanied with a bright pink cast everywhere I went. I was not feeling it. My dad, never one for going to the theatre, offered to take me to Pizza Hut instead. It was a rare opportunity to spend time with my dad who had often been working very long hours. He worked as a police officer, which at the time, I didn't really take an interest in what he did. We had a great evening, and we came back to the car with full bellies and some leftover pizza. I remember babbling away to my dad, as I had been the whole night, enthralled to have my dad's undivided attention. After a while, I noticed he wasn't really responding anymore. We were fairly near home, but still on the main roads before we turned off to our housing estate. At first, I thought he'd just lost interest, but I glanced across and noticed that he was permanently looking in the rearview mirror. I asked what was up, and he said, That car behind us has been following us all the way from Pizza Hut. I glanced behind and commented that we were still on the main roads, and I couldn't see that this was an unusual route for this guy to take. He said I need to see whether he is. I don't want to lead this guy to our house. I rolled my eyes. My dad was always paranoid about this kind of stuff. We wouldn't even tell our friends we'd gone on holiday because he was convinced the house would get broken into whilst we was away. We were coming up to a residential area before ours that I knew from doing a newspaper round. I suggested the street coming up on the left as it loops round in a horseshoe shape through an estate and brings you back out to the same made road we was on, just further up. Nobody would take this road to come out onto the main road again. My dad turned off and so did the car. I will never forget that feeling, that sinking feeling as I watched the car sharply turn behind ours. The car placed its full beams on. I let out a gasp and I looked at my dad. He'd gone into work mode. He had completely shut me out. He accelerated down the street and as we came to the main road, I saw there were many cars still on the main road. He pulled straight out onto the main road, meaning the car coming on the main road needed to brake sharply and held down their horn at us. I kept my eyes on the road ahead of us breathing deeply as my dad weaved in and out of the lanes. A part of me was completely terrified, and a part of me was still convinced that this wasn't really happening, that he had exaggerated or mistaken this. He wasn't really following us. I dared to look in the side view mirror, and saw it was a different car behind us. I felt myself relax a little. 
We turn left at the coming roundabout, giving very little room to anyone, and a few moments of holding my breath, thinking we were going to hear the sound of metal or metal. The street we had turned onto was slightly quieter than the road previous. I slowly glanced into the side mirror, and it was a different car behind us. I sighed relief, and thought that it had been really my dad's imagination. Suddenly, the rearview mirror became a little bit more illuminated again, and I awkwardly turned in my seat to see a car pull out sharply from behind the car behind us, and pull quickly into behind our cars again. I looked at my dad again. He grabbed his phone from his pocket and told me to call someone in particular in his phone and put it on speaker. My hands were shaking, I could barely press the buttons. A cheerful voice answered before he could say anything else, and my dad quickly summarised what's happened. There was a pause, I could hear the voices speaking in the background, radios beeping and answering through radios. My dad barked at me to keep naming the streets we were on to the guy on the phone, as my dad ran we turned down the streets, trying to keep to the main roads. I'm randomly calling names and trying to remember to see the direction we was heading in. The car was so close behind us and completely blinding any view behind us. All I could think of was please don't hit us, if we crash, we can't run. What the hell can I do? My leg had only just been blasted. I knew I stood no chance. I suddenly wondered if they were getting close enough to take a shot at us. This for me was unthinkable. It was England. This isn't the norm. Why the hell would someone shoot us? We continued to weave down streets and random turns as I tossed around in the front seat, clutching onto the mobile in my trembling hands. The voice on the phone shouted, Turn into the Tesco car park that's coming up on the left. We have three response vehicles coming from the other direction. My dad sharply turned into the car park, skipping the red light. I shut my eyes, again, waiting for the sound of metal on metal. As we swung into the empty car park near, the car behind us was in close pursuit. Blue lights surrounded our car for what felt like all directions. The sound of sirens was deafening. My dad got straight out of the car and ran behind the car. I screamed, thinking someone could have a gun, and tried to look over my shoulder to see when my door swung open and a police officer was crouching into the car to help me get out. My arms were complete jelly and I couldn't even use the crutches to help me stand. Another police officer came between them and helped me as I hopped to the back of the police car. They were kind and tried to distract me as I was trying to see what was going on and where my dad was. I couldn't really see from my ankle and I also couldn't turn properly due to my leg. They did their best to reassure me, and one had clearly just been through the nearby McDonald's drive through and offered me his tea. I just sobbed, begging them to tell me what was going on. My dad, after some time, came over to the car and told them to take me home. He had checked, and my mum was back home with my brother. As the police car turned around in the car park, back towards the entrance, we could see the police surrounding the vehicle, and three men, who looked to be in their late 20s, were handcuffed, leaning over the car, whilst a sniffer dog and two police officers were taking things out of the car, one of which was a baseball bat. When my dad got home late that night, I asked him what that was all about. Who the hell were those men, and why were they following us? He was very reluctant to tell me anything. He did admit it was because of him that they were following us. He explained that he was in a drugs team that dealt with how I understand this as an adult. The interception of large shipments of drugs that were being transferred across the country, and sometimes, people lost a lot of money when they were caught. I just stared at him. I had no idea what to say. He just shrugged and said, Sometimes people get upset about that. I was on a date in Camden with a girl who, from photos, I wasn't overly excited about but in the flesh made my eyebrows shoot off my head. She was really pretty and smart and funny. We had quite a few cocktails, and I think it was the Blue's Kitchen, before going to the gay bar in Camden, which had since closed down. I think it was called the Black Cap. The day was going well, and we meet these people who join in our table, and the guy tells me at the bar my date said she wanted me to kiss her. I did, and it turned out the guy was just helping us out by moving things along. My date was really shocked, and told me it was bold, but she liked it. She came back to my hotel room with me, which was like a 10 minute walk away. The room was kind of small, but cool, with a space age sort of style to it. We were both drunk and made out a lot. She started crying about problems she was having with a friend who was really sick, and her job that was really stressful, 
full on sobbing. She left in embarrassment, even though I wasn't worried about her leaving like that, but she said she'd be okay. As she left, I saw a large man in a black thick leather jacket in the corridor. He was staring at my date as she left, and then stared at me as I closed the door. I was pretty wasted, so after checking my date got on a bus, I had a nap and was woken by banging on the door. I ignored it, but then it just kept going, so I staggered up to the door and opened it a crack. I recognised the leather elbow and arm as the door was shoved open violently. I was drunk, and the jolt of the door caused me to fall over. Luckily, the room entrance was small, and around the width of the door, so my back was against the wall by the door, whilst my feet touched the other wall. My body kept the door closed as this man kept shoving against the door. I managed to get it closed again, locked it, and went to sleep as I was still drunk. When I woke up in the morning, I thought I'd dreamt the man at the door. But when I looked up and down the side of my ribs, my hips and my thigh, I had dark bruises. I was really lucky, and I'm so glad that my room was tight on space, because if it hadn't, that guy would have got in so easily. So there was this girl I was talking to at the time, and I needed to have a talk. Yeah, that one. And we decided that we would go to our local college town statue to do so. Many kids that go to our college went to hang out there, take pictures, climb on the statue, college kid stuff. Basically, this statue was 30 minutes away from the middle of just farmland. The road to get there is a small, one lane each direction road. I don't know the story behind it or anything, but it's a popular, you'd think safe, place. So we decided to head out, and it was probably 1am at that point. So you could see the stars and all of that. It was pitch black outside. When we got there, I got a really creepy feeling, but we wanted to take a look at the statue, so we got out of the car anyway, and proceeded to walk to the statue. About a five minute walk from the gravel parking spot. We take a look, and decided to get back in my car, because it was dark and cold outside. This is when I decided to keep my engine running and back up into the spot so I could look at the small road to see if anything was happening. Now about 10 minutes into our conversation, I see a large white SUV, I think it's an Escalade, drive past us. I didn't think anything of it, but it was the only other car we'd seen all night. The car drives maybe a quarter of a mile down the road and suddenly does a three point turn. Weird, but it's not a problem. He then comes back towards us and takes a right onto a side road that sat directly in front of us. At this point, I'm like, okay, he missed a turn, no problem. About a quarter mile down the side road, the SUV does another three point turn and is now facing my car directly. The SUV is stopped 100 feet or so in front of us with its headlights blaring down my car, a compact sedan. Now, I was like, okay, this is super weird, I'm gonna get out of here. Suddenly, the car drives straight ahead into our gravel lot and sort of blocks off the only entrance and exit. The SUV then sits here again, and we're directly facing each other. At this point, all of my spidey senses are in full gear, and I'm ready to book it. The girl with me is like, no, we need to finish talking, he's just being weird. I decide to just start hauling ass, and as soon as I squeeze my car out of the lot onto the road, the SUV is tailing me. So I'm like, okay, this guy obviously wants to do something with us. I told the girl to call the cops, but of course, in the middle of nowhere, there's no service. I start to absolutely push my car, and I'm going 120 plus miles per hour on this small country road surrounded by nothing. And of course, the SUV is right on our tail. The road that we're on is straight of nothingness for 15 miles, and we continue driving. Once we finally reached to a sense of civilization, there was an intersection with other cars. I finally get my sigh of relief and thought this guy would leave us alone, so just to test or trick him. I turn on my left signal and get ready to turn. I turn my wheel enough so that it looks like I was going to turn, and then I put my entire weight on my gas and went straight. He followed me exactly, with the turn signal, turning, accelerating, everything. A couple of miles later, we finally get reception and call the police. As we're on the phone with them, there is a brightly lit gas station, one of those big ones, like Quick Trip or Racetrack, and we turn into that because if this guy is going to kill or kidnap us, he's going to have to do it where other people can see. As soon as I turn into that gas station, he books it and hauls ass wherever the hell he was going. 
We gave a description of what happened to us to the dispatcher and continued on our conversation. To this day, I don't know what the person wanted or what their objective was, but I'm glad I didn't find out. This story takes place in November 2017. I was 18. I'm a very short girl, 4 foot 10, and I get anxious when someone even looks at me in a way to suggest they might not like me. So needless to say, I'm incredibly non-confrontational. My friend and I were out shopping. It was something we'd do maybe every few months just to bond since we didn't have much time to hang due to college. She's just like me, barely scraped 5 foot 1 and very non-confrontational. It's probably why we became friends. On every shopping trip, we would find ourselves in Ann Summers. We are both overly endowed and struggled to find bras anywhere else. And Ann Summers had some great sales, so we'd grab at the cheap bras while we could. This shopping trip wasn't any different. We browsed shops until we got to Ann Summers, but that's when things took a turn. I had barely stepped foot into the shop when a woman with sort of a Slavic accent stopped me. Her finger jammed into my chest. Spit the gum out, she demanded. Assuming she was an employee, I gave her a very sheepish, I'm really sorry, and ran out of the shop and spat my gum out and threw it away. When I went back in, I realised that this woman was not an employee. She was a customer who was browsing and happened to be near the door when my friend and I entered the shop. It should have been obvious to me at the time, no salesperson would ever have been like that. Not one that wanted to keep their job anyway. But I kept my head down, and when I walked past her, holding my breath in hopes that she wouldn't notice me again. She didn't, and I thought I was in the clear. My friend and I browsed the shop, trying to avoid the woman, but the shop wasn't very big, probably only 15 feet by about 18 feet, so eventually I ended up at the cell stand by the door where she had been stood. I tried to keep my distance while browsing. I was looking at the price tags, but realised I didn't know what the discount was, so I leaned over slightly to check the discount sign. It's important to note that this woman had a pushchair, which is a stroller for the Americans. You'd think that maybe she had a child in this pushchair, but no, it was full of plastic carrier bags. I didn't look too much at it, but I could tell that everything in there was double bagged and tied shut. Whatever was in those bags she wanted to protect. This sense of protection became very relevant because when I leaned over to look at the discount sign, I was leaning slightly close to her pushchair. She was about three feet away, but apparently it was too close. The woman was on the other side of the chair, but the moment she saw me, she ran around it to where I was stood. She hit me in the face. It was somewhere between a slap and a punch. I couldn't quite tell because I was in shock. All I knew is that it hurt. Watch the personal space, she hissed in my ear. I apologised to her. This woman just hit me and I apologised to her. I regret it now, but at the time, I didn't want to provoke her any further. Not that I knew that I did anything to provoke her in the first place. In shock, I turned around and ran to the back area, grabbing my friend's hand and pulling her with me. The back area was separated by a tiny wall that only stretched halfway across the shop since the adult toys were stored there and wanted to keep them out of sight from the general public. I stood there, holding my friend's hand and shaking as I whispered, She just hit me, to my friend. We stood there for a good minute in silence. My friend was positioned in a way that she could see the rest of the store while I hid behind the wall. She's gone, my friend told me. I let out a breath that I didn't know I was holding. Can we stay in here a while? I asked my friend, worried that the woman would be outside waiting for me. The front of the store was open, but she could have easily just have been a couple of feet down the road and out of sight waiting for me to leave. My friend agreed and we slowly browsed the shop again. About five minutes later we got to the counter to check out. The girl working behind the counter looked outside then looked back at us. That woman had been in here for 30 minutes. I didn't know what to do. She told the two of us. She told me to spit out my gum when we first came in and then she hit me because I was too close to her, I told her. She hit you? The worker was wide eyed. If I'd known that I would have called security, I'm so sorry. I smiled and shrugged. It's fine. It really wasn't fine, but it wasn't the worker's fault. She didn't look too much older than I did, and I wouldn't have known what to do in her situation either. Still shaken up, my friend and I made our way out the store. I looked around, but I didn't see the woman. Can we go home now? I asked my friend. 
We hadn't finished browsing all the shops, but I was just so paranoid we'd bump into the woman again. She agreed, and we got the bus home. When I got home, my parents encouraged me to report the incident to the police. I called an non-emergency line, and their answer was basically, well, what do you expect us to do about it? Unless I went back to the end summers and requested the security footage, which I wasn't even sure if they actually had. They wouldn't do anything. It's been over three years now, and I'm sure that the woman was likely to have been homeless and or on drugs. It's the only explanation I can think of the carrier bags and their protectiveness. It was either everything she owned or drugs, or both. So, to the possibly homeless, possibly drugged up woman who hit me, I hope in the current state the world is treating you well, and you're finally getting the personal space you wanted. But let's not meet again. This was several years ago now, when I was in college, and I was headed back to my apartment late one night after being out with friends. As I went to make a left turn into the complex, I checked to see if anyone was behind me, and since no one was in front of me or behind me, I opted not to worry about using a turn signal. I parked outside my building, and as I was crossing the street to get to my apartment, a car was driving towards me. I wondered where it came come from, since I was sure no one was near me when I turned in, but I was only 18, very short and naive, and instead of being cautious or fearful, I instead wanted to be helpful. The car stopped approximately 16 feet or so away from me as I was right in the middle of the street and a man got out and asked, Do you live here? I thought maybe he needed directions and I told him that I did live there. As he asked this, he is walking towards me and as soon as I answered he lunged at me, grabbed a handful of my hair with his right hand and grabbed my throat with his left and started dragging me to his car as he growled that he ought to cut my effing neck. To say that I was in shock was an understatement. His car was running with the door open, and it wasn't until I saw his car door before my brain literally used my name and said, Caitlin, scream. Once I finally started screaming, he pushed me away while he jumped in his car and took off, and I ran to the apartment. I was shaking so badly I could barely get my key in the lock, and once inside, I realised my boyfriend was there because he'd usually come by earlier in the night to surprise me, but since I wasn't home, he'd gone off to bed, of course I was still freaking out, but instead of him being concerned, he acted like an ass because he was upset that I was coming in so late and I didn't even call the police. Once I told my mum the next day, she insisted that I call them, but nothing ever came of it. I often wondered what the guy thought I did to deserve to have my effing neck cut. I'm sure it wasn't because I didn't use a turn signal, so I even wonder where he came from. I never wanted to meet him again, no else ever did. Back in July 2018, me and my three best friends decided to go on a vacation to Barcelona. The four of us, all females, were 18 at the time and just finished our freshman year of college. For context, we had planned this trip for several months, but the lazy asses we are took our time before booking our flights in Airbnb. We eventually started our search in May, and if you have ever been to Barcelona, you might know that it's already pretty late if you want to find an affordable and well located summer accommodation. We ended up scrolling on several websites for days as everything was way out of our budget. One of my friends finally found this very decent studio located on the Ramblas, a very touristy neighbourhood. The condo was actually located on a narrow street that was perpendicular to the main Rambler. You had to walk about 500 metres, about 0.3 miles, until you arrived at a sketchier end of the street where the flat was. It didn't really bother us as the building was pretty secure. You had to open the first front door that led to the streets, and then you had to take the stairs to the second floor where you had a second door which required another key. This second door led to three condos, so we had a third and final key to our personal flat. This final door didn't have any outdoor handle, which meant that if we were to leave without our keys, we would end up locked out. There was finally no outside handle on the balcony door either, you could only open the door from the inside. It might seem like a lot of details, but it's important for what comes next. The day we checked in, we are pretty excited despite our terrible exhaustment. We'd been travelling for 15 hours at that point, so we decided to go smoke a cigarette on the balcony. The balcony next to ours belonged to the next door neighbours, who were a bunch of Italian boys who we only met at that very moment. 
They've been pretty loud throughout our stay, but we never thought too much of it. As last elements of context, our condo was disposed as follows. The front door led to the main room, which there was two of my friends were sleeping. There was a bed on the left, and at the end of the room was the living room, which also worked as a kitchen and a bedroom. The sofa was foldable, where my third friend and I were sleeping. We were there for five nights. As the young woman that we were, our daily routine was pretty consistent. We'd go clubbing every night, go home around 4am, pass out in our beds and wake up at 11. We'd then visit the city until about 7pm and get ready to repeat. Our first three nights were awesome. We had made some male friends who were staying in Barcelona too, so we'd meet up with them and it was fun. Yet yeah, the fourth night was rather creepy. We'd gone home at 4am, screwed around with my friends for an hour until we fell asleep at about 5. Around 7.30, my friend who was sleeping with me in the room and suffers from sleep paralysis wakes up as she feels something is tickling her ankle. She opens her eyes and sees someone crouching at the end of the bed, his hand on her ankle, as if he was looking at something under the bed. At this moment, she's convinced that she's experienced sleep paralysis again, but the fear makes her sit on the bed and shout, What the F? Which rarely happens with sleep paralysis as your muscles are often numb. The shouting wakes me up and I see the guy too, at the end of our bed, and still half asleep I whisper, Edward? I think I'd been dreaming about a friend of mine and confused this guy with him. The guy gets scared, suddenly gets up and stares at us and then tiptoes away saying, oops, oops, oops. He walks past the bed where my friends are dead asleep and walks out the front door. My friend and I stayed up for a long time talking about what we just experienced and then we woke the other girls up and told them a story. We never knew how this guy broke into our flat, and he didn't steal anything, even though we had ostentatiously left our credit cards, IDs, phones, and cash on the table. The only thing is, that night, we didn't lock the front door, but it was closed, so normally no one could open it as there was no handle, unless someone had a key. We chose not to talk to the police about it because of this, as it could have told us that we were responsible for not locking the door properly. We also chose not to tell the landlord for the same reason but also because we didn't want it to ruin our last day there. We tried contacting the neighbours, the Italian guys, and went to their flat and knocked, but they never opened the door. Looking back at it, we should have definitely done something about it, as we shouldn't have stayed there for another minute, but we were too young I guess. We never figured out what the guy wanted, nor what he was looking for under the bed. None of this makes sense to be fair. Why would someone come to someone's place, uninvited, to look for something at 7.30 while the occupants are asleep. I guess we'll never know. This happened to me when I was 21, after an OD suicide attempt. I woke up in the hospital in the middle of the night to a nurse saying he needed to replace my IV. He jabs me two or three times but doesn't hit a vein. So I ask if I could get someone else to try. He says no and keeps going. As he's doing this, he's pushing and wiggling the needles around under my skin, saying he's trying to forget the vein. By the 7 for 8 needle, it registers that he's intentionally trying to hurt me. I ask him, why are you doing this? He just says, it's your own fault you're here. I was too weak to fight back and it was the middle of the night. There was no one else around that I could call out to. I have no idea how many times he ended up puncturing me in the end. The next day, a different nurse was talking about my IV. She was horrified because she said it was the biggest needle she'd ever seen used on a living patient. Not sure why you'd need to use needles on a dead patient, but that's what she said anyway. A lot of people shrug this off when I tell them about it, but it was so terrifying being alone, helpless, and knowing that the person who was supposed to care for you hated you and wanted to cause you pain. So yeah. Nurse who loves huge needles and hates mentally ill girls, let's never meet again. Edit, thanks for everyone for your kind words of support. You don't even know what it means to me. For those wondering, I'm doing much better now. This happened seven years ago, and I didn't report it. Very small town. I was scared that people I work with would find out about my suicide attempt if I pursued it. Plus, I was just focused on survival. You've all encouraged me though, and I'm doing my best to track this guy down and report it to someone. Sending my love to all of those who shared their own medical stories of abuse and trauma in the comments.
This past September, I had taken a road trip down to Myrtle Beach with my family. It was myself, my mother, my sister, her husband and her two kids. We had used my car and both my sister and my husband's car to transport everything and all of us. We had rented a beach house for a little over a week and had a pretty great time. I was in the middle of a difficult point in my life and struggling with employment and being in between jobs and having just started two new jobs fresh. I was a little low on funds and worried about making my car payments and the like, so I opted to head home two days early with my car so I could try and get more hours at work. My family expressed being nervous as I planned to leave after dinner and drive through the night to get home. I consoled them that I'd be okay to be up all night and I'd just head straight home and only stop for gas and food as needed. I'm an excellent driver, a tad impatient, so I tend to go until I absolutely had to stop and take a break. However, this would be a 12 hour trip and I knew I needed breaks. So I made a point to stop at every rest stop and at least get out and stretch. So I stayed awake and didn't get too sore. Going through West Virginia, I'm sure you guys know how secluded their rest stops and visitor centers and the likes are. Especially when you're heading north from the south, going through the mountains. I stopped at a visitor center because they had advertising that they had fast food joints and I had to piss like a racehorse. This was sometime very late at night, maybe 1am to 3am sometime. Side note that sent shivers down my spine after what happened. I like to drive barefoot, so I pulled in, noticed the buildings with fast food were closed, so I drove around the parking lot under streetlight in front of the visitor center so I could use the restroom. Laying out my door, I took my time putting my shoes on to walk inside, having looked around and not seeing anything out of the ordinary. I checked my phone and grabbed my wallet before standing up to walk in, making sure my car horn had beeped to signal the doors were locked. Walking towards the centre, I saw a man in a white hoodie standing at the edge of the sidewalk leaning into the centre. I didn't think much of it until I passed him and got an off vibe. I glanced over my shoulder and he was watching me walk in. For some reason, I glanced to my left as I turned back to face forward and noticed another man sitting on the benches that were on the other side of the tall thin bushes. Instantly I thought, nope, 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 nope. I went in and peed, and before I walked out of the bathroom, I called my roommate, as dumb as it was because he was a good four to six hours away, I just felt safer. I gave him a rundown of my situation and made him stay on the phone with me. I started to walk out, and I couldn't see the man at the front of the sidewalk anymore. I glanced to my now right and saw both men standing next to a bench. Facing forward, I saw a couple walking in to presumably use the restroom as well. I had an impulse to ask them to walk with me, but my paranoia kicked in because I knew something was wrong somewhere in my situation and I didn't ask, thinking they might know the men. Walking briskly to my car, I explained to my roommate that the men were by the benches. Daring the smallest of the peaks over my shoulder again, I saw the man in the white hoodie walking towards me and told my roommate. Walking a few more paces, I looked back again and saw his pace had quickened. At this point, I told my roommate that he's following me to my car and I booked it. I thankfully had a fob key. I got my key out and ready and I locked my car and practically threw myself in, not there in a glance back. I threw my car in reverse and gunned it backwards before going back into drive and sped off and didn't even stop to put my seatbelt on until I was at the exit to leave the parking lot. I didn't look back once. Stopped at the next toll road and filed a report and the workers called for state troopers to head over to check things out. I didn't stop shaking for hours, and I refused to get out of my car until I was home. I horrified myself at the thought of, if those guys had paid attention and made their move more quickly, they could have incapacitated me at my car while I was facing the ground and putting my shoes on, and I could have had absolutely no defence.